What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you're watching the show on YouTube, make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of the discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here to YouTube and you just haven't done it yet, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you never miss another sit down video. If you're checking us out on our audio version, welcome in. Make sure you leave us a five star review. We are back, ladies and gentlemen, with another episode of the show. I am your host, Jeff Nato, and as always, we are presented by Bar Stool Sports. It's back to the world of the American Mafia today here on the sit down. And we've got a very interesting discussion that's about to be had here on the show. Today, we're going to head out to the world in Chicago. I was just in the Windy City last week, and I have to say, I enjoyed myself. Chicago outfit is always something in mob circles that is a bit of a mystique to a lot of us folks that listen or enjoy this type of thing. New York obviously takes center stage, but to me, I have to say, I think the Chicago Outfit's are probably the most interesting organization when we talk about the American Mafia. It's a fascinating look into a lot of very secret individuals. And one of the things that I've always noticed about Chicago is really outside of Al Capone, they've always held the title of very secret. They're not flashy. They're not out uh, with, with thousand dollar suits and, and neckties and uh, handkerchiefs like uh, John Gotti or something like that. They're very secretive. And we've talked about that in some of our content today there. We're going to speak to a guy that I've been looking to get on for a long time, a man who followed at least initially in the footsteps of his uh, father, an individual who is notorious in the world and the history of the Chicago Alpha. Today we are joined a former Chicago gangster, Frank Calabrese. Frank, you are um, really, I think, one of the more interesting people, particularly not only in the history of Chicago, but in the history of the American Mafia. You did some things that are, are just quite extraordinary, actually, and we're going to talk about them today. Uh, first of all, though, how are you, how you doing? Uh, obviously, I know you, uh, you wrote a book. We're going to talk about that. Um, it's actually a great book, and I urge anyone who is interested in this world. I'm asked all the time about books. I would go check this book out. You know, obviously, it's a New York Times bestseller. And you, Frank, you even got Nick Pelleggi to talk good about the book. How about that? Yeah. Um, how are you today? Good to see you. I, I'm good, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, a little bit about the book real quick. A couple of things is um, when you look at the cover, it, it, it looks like it's just a mob book about the Chicago mob. In reality, it's it, it's a family story. And, um, you know, I, I grew up in Chicago and my ethnic background is half Irish, half Italian. My, my mother's side, Hanley, my grandfather fought at, against Al Capone in the O'Donnell gang. And my uncle Ed was the international president of the hotel and restaurant employee union for over 33 years. How about that? The wow. Italian side, my dad and my uncle were both made high ranking made members of the Chicago mob, in which I followed my dad in. Also about the book is the book is... Um, was signed off on by the government, which doesn't usually happen for authenticity. So I've never had one lawsuit. They agreed everything in there was truthful, and um, and it's about it's about my my life, and it's about the trial. Uh, this in this case, there was only one other time that the government used the RICO Act the way it was supposed to be used, and that was the commission case in New York when they went after the five families. This was the first time they used it in Chicago. Yeah, the, and the trial you're talking about is, is really, like I said, the word extraordinary means a lot in this because it was an extraordinary trial. And, you know, to be honest, what's interesting about it is when we think Chicago, we think of, you know, Al Capone, you know, the 20s, 30s. You know, the Family Secrets trial happened in the mid-2000s. It wasn't very long ago this all went down, and we're going to talk about it. Um, I think that's really interesting that you had the government write off on your book because that's a really smart thing to do, obviously. You know, nowadays on YouTube and, and some of this stuff, we hear all these different stories, and sometimes you take it with a grain of salt about what some of these individuals say. I think it's interesting that you know, obviously a lot of the info I get is from you know indictments and um, different government sites and trials and things. I think it's smart of you to do that. Good for you. I'm glad you did that. Uh, and the yeah. book's great. I'm, I'm going to also leave a link to the book in the description sure. of the video. So if you're looking to grab it, go go get it. I, I think it's a must have for anybody's library that really enjoys this. Uh, Frank, you were born in 1960. Is that correct? Yes, correct. I was born in 1960. Your father, obviously, as you said, was Italian. Your mother was Irish. That's pretty interesting that they go back to to the to the years of of, of the 30s and kind of you know, kind of on opposite sides, if you will. 
Now, what I find interesting about Chicago is you mentioned, um, and I, I've obviously um, interviewed people from Chicago, kind of the interesting thing about a lot of the people that were involved with the life, some of them weren't fully Italian. You know, you look at someone like Gus Alex, right? Um, I guess that's an interesting dynamic. What was your household like when you were a kid? You know, what, what, you know, did, what did you learn what your father did for a living? Cause you know, it's, it's obviously a different career than, than most. Yeah. Um, so in Chicago, as the years went on, they went more underground. They tried to go more legit because of um, the government getting stronger. They wanted to be a secret organization and, and you weren't supposed to bring your kids into this life. You were supposed to make a better life for them, a little different than New York. Okay. So me growing up as a young kid, me and my brothers in our neighborhood, I grew up in a neighborhood called Elmwood Park, the Grand and Harlem area. And um, there were a lot of my bosses that lived in that area and a lot of my friends. But we didn't we didn't hang on corners uh, or social clubs or anything like that. We weren't supposed to, we weren't supposed to mention what our our, our family did, our father, my father did. And we were taught to have respect for everybody. Um, go to school, get a job. I started working when I was in eighth grade. I had the biggest paper out at 14 years old. I was, I was a busboy at a local restaurant. So I did it because me and my friends, we all worked. We weren't supposed to go in this life. Most of the stuff I learned when I was young was what I read in the newspapers. But then as I got a little older, and I want to say starting high school, my dad wanted to teach me a little bit about the street. He says, you're going to learn street smarts from me. You're going to go to school and learn book smarts. If you know a little bit about both, you're going to be very successful. So he gave me these little tasks. He was grooming me a little bit more so to teach me about the street. And as time went on, my dad started to see a lot of me, a lot of him and me, and he brought me further along, further along to the point where I actually wound up being my father's secret weapon, he called it, because he wasn't supposed to bring into this. So, you know, your father is is obviously a, a really, you know, interesting individual. I think that's one word, but it, he's also, we could say, a bit of a depraved individual as well. I mean, he he did some things that were, were fairly um, violent. He was a, a known you know, member of the Chicago Alpha, and we'll get into some of the the stuff that he did. But you know, your father was born in the early 30s. He grew up, obviously, you would probably say a little bit different than yourself. He grew up, you know, in a very poor family, uh, Grant and Ogden, right? That Grant area. Grant and Ogden, the patch. When they were young, um, him and my him and my uncles, my grandfather got a newspaper stand on Grant and State Street so they could make extra money for the house. And my dad was kind of like the family patriarch, you know. Yeah, he was. We went through a lot of stuff, but you know, he was proud of it. There were a lot of people in that neighborhood that was, were poor. My dad was a very tough guy. But yet he hated bullies and he was not a bully at one time. He had a huge heart. He'd always help people. Over the years, my dad be changed, but this life changed him. The people he got around, his mentor, Angelo Lepitra, very violent people, the people he was around. And that changed my dad over the years. And he started to bring it in the house over time. There's that phrase we use all the time. My dad used to say when we were younger, don't bring your street in the house. It corrodes the family structure. And that line between street and family started to deteriorate. And, and that's as you got older, right? As a family, we all started seeing this. Yes. Mm -hmm. As we got older, we started seeing this changing. And, and, get, and he started getting more paranoid. He started getting more controlling. He started getting more violent. And I'm talking about with family members. I'm not talking about the street. So, you know, that, that was a big part of our life. And, and, and we've seen that growing. But when we were young, when you asked me earlier, Jeff, we didn't see a lot of that. My father kept it away from the house. You know, we had a lot of rules. Okay, we had curfews. We had, um, you know, uh, school. I went to a Catholic high school for sports, football and basketball, which I lettered in. And, um, you know, he was a strict father. We used to go on family vacations. So he kept the business away from the house. So there are a lot of good memories of that. But as we got older, and we seen what a lot of this was really about. And when I seen how my father was changing, I wanted to get away from him because I've always worked my whole life. And I think that's what saved me to this day is I'm always working. Right. 
So you had a pretty nor I mean, from what you're saying, I mean, really up until let's say high school, you had a pretty normal childhood, right? It was you had dinner with your family at night and, and you went to vacations with your family. It pre seems pretty wholesome, pretty normal. Uh, and your dad had a job like anyone else. And you all knew as, as kids in that area, you just kind of, you did what you were told. You had a pretty normal life. It seems like now I'm going to bring something up here, Frank. Um, I found a picture of, of, of what, I would have to imagine as you and and your your father and and your brothers. Do you remember this picture? You know, this sounds this looks like a good time possibly. I, I, I do. I do remember that picture. Ironically, the person that posted that picture is Michael Spilatro, the son of Michael Spilatro and Tony Spilatro who were killed in Casino. Their families were very close with us. This was a get together up in Lake Geneva. And um, my youngest brother, Nikki, my brother, Kurt, and myself, I mean, we were young teenagers, but, mm -hmm. you know, that we were always together with a lot of these people. You know, my dad was close with, with the Spilatros and, and a lot of people around him. So that was a, a barbecue in the summer. When you, and that's what I want to ask. So when you, you're, you're, let's say, how old are you in that picture? 14, 15, maybe? I want to guess, yeah, right around there. Okay. The beginning of high school. So you have these, you know, let's just say cookouts or events where you're, you're kind of all together. And you mentioned you're around people like Tony Spilatra. I mean, th there's films made about him now. Um, did were, you, were they just introduced as like, this is your uncle? Like, is this your, like, when you meet these people, you meet an individual like this, right? Angela, yeah. Hulk, who's yeah, your- Yeah, that was my dad's mentor. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he was on the ranch to me. My okay. brother married his- granddaughter that's how close we were with him and his family um uh but like tony spilatro we were closer with michael spilatro because tony lived in vegas but a lot of people around but those those weren't kid, those weren't called uncles and stuff you know growing up we had a friend what our fathers did but they never talked business and they'd walk away you know family events were important and it was to enjoy the time then you'd see the guys walk off and you know talk if they needed to talk or something like that uh, but they everybody dressed you see we just look like a normal family yeah um <laughs> you would be surprised how easy these guys would fit in wear glasses a pipe at the time makes you soften your looks blend in don't have some kind of walk when you walk just kind of walk straight keep your head down a little act very meek but always be aware of your surroundings i mean there was so much that we were taught you know, when you pulled out money, don't pull out a big wad and flash it. Don't have a big entourage, okay? And don't hang around with the people regularly that you work with. So as time went on and the government got stronger, all the guys in our crew, we didn't hang out. Once a month, my dad would get everybody together and there'd be a restaurant somewhere where there's a back room or something where we'd go eat and enjoy it uh, because he didn't want to make it easy for the government. Everything was about the government watching you. Very Everything cool. Everything about perception. Sure. Very covert. And and I, I, I initially in this, it, your father's story kind of melds into your own. So I'm kind of trying to, I'm getting a little more on that. So you mentioned like Angela the Hook, right? You know, this is a guy that hung people on meat hooks and things like that. But these were guys that did what they had to do because that was the life they were in. Your dad ultimately would become part of the Chinatown crew. I have a question for you. Is it true your father couldn't read? Is that correct? He had dyslexia. Dyslexia. Dyslexia, yeah. Yeah, and he, yeah, he had a hard time reading, and he had a hard time writing, too. You know, sometimes he'd write a note to me, and instead of Frank, it'd be Frack, and, you know, yeah, he, and he was very, he didn't like the fact, he didn't want anybody to know, so he was very protective, because he felt that if somebody thought he couldn't read or write, he only had an eighth grade education. Yeah. And uh, so he felt that if somebody, if somebody seen he couldn't read or write, you know, that they think of him less of a man. Weak, right. The case. Yeah, weak, yeah. But ultimately, for your father, he, like you, I mean, you would all get into this juice loan business, and he would become pretty successful. He made a lot of money in his life, really? um, had, you know, the, all the things that he wanted. I guess, tell me and, and kind of educate people a little bit on what a, the juice loan business is, because it's something that in Chicago was very important and integral to kind of the maturation of, of the outfit. I mean, we know, we've heard the names Mad Sam Di Stefano, people like that. They were very involved with that business. You know, how important was that business to your dad? And kind of tell us a little bit about it. Yeah. So loan sharking goes all the way back to Shakespeare, Shylock King. And the East yeah. Coast, they call it the big, the vigorous. In Chicago, we call the juice. Yep. Um, juice loans, high interest rate loans. And that's what they were. Okay. There was a time uh, when my father had one of the biggest um, operations on the street. 
you know, in the 80s at one point. Um, I think we never had less than a million dollars on the street, roughly charging about 10% a week, which is 520% a year. Now, not everybody got charged 10%. My dad was a businessman. He said, first of all, we don't bury people. He says, and he used to love to get collateral. We'd get car, car titles, we'd get uh, jewelry. We don't bury people. He, and he had a lot of legitimate businessmen, too, that wanted to borrow money quick. Because back then, you had to go to a bank in 30, 60 days. They needed 10 or 20,000. So we would charge them 2.5%. There was a closing cost, just like when you go to the bank. And uh, he ran it. He ran it like a business. You know, and he would, he, it wasn't about scaring people to hurt them. But also knowing that if you're going to pay, you got to pay. Say, Jeff, you borrowed 5000 from us and um, and some rough, some stuff came and you couldn't pay. You lost your job. You got a wife. You got kids. What we would do is he would take it and make it $10,000, your, your loan, and then you, everything you give us would go off. It would all become principal. There's no more interest. So we double, we double your loan. But so then if you can only pay us $50 a week, it would keep coming down. Right. And as long as somebody's trying, we would work with them more than a bank. Now, actually, enough, Frank, I mean, what you're telling me right now seems, again, pretty wholesome. I mean, loan companies do that all over this country, right? Yeah. Now, what makes what your father did illegal is if you don't pay, he assaults you or breaks your legs or, or and that's kind of, and plus the fact that he's not, you know, paying taxes on the money that he's making and it's not a legit business. Let me ask you, out of, let's say. Violence was always the last resort, which you Sure. Know. Well, what I wanted to ask you, let's say you have, and I know you had way more, but let's say you had 100 customers, right? How frequent was hurting someone? That doesn't happen much, right? That, that's No. So why not just make it a legal business? Because this is legal. <laughs> I mean, it, that's what I never, I guess, one thing I never understood about some of that world is they're very, they're full of ingenuity. They're very smart people. But some of this stuff is not actually illegal if you just. I know that I answer your question right now. Um, in the in the 80s, um, uh, my one uncle was that wasn't really involved as it was a accountant. And he says, you know, Frank, you could go legal with this. Yeah. So he says, Frankie, work with Uncle Joe. We're going to make a lot of this legal. You know, a lot of those businessmen. You use, OK, mm -hmm. we did it for almost a year when it came time to pay taxes. My dad says, what? They don't like Uncle Sam as a partner. Right. So we closed everything down. We went back to the way. We were on the early stages of payday loans. So you're actually right. There's yeah. guys there now that I know that that own companies like that, and they say, "I've never made so much money in my life." Yeah, I, 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 it's something like I look at. Um, you know, there's an individual, a billionaire, Dan Gilbert. He owns the Cleveland Cavaliers. He's, I believe, the originator of Quicken Loan, which is like essentially what it's your usually. father was doing. Yeah, and it's easier. You don't have to hurt somebody. You can go take their house. You can take whatever you want right. from them. You can garnish their wages legally. Right, because when you're really looking back on, like what I said, it's not like you really had to hurt many people anyway because you kind of had a reputation that perceived yourself, and you already were taking stuff from them, and it's just like any other business. That's really interesting that your father, the only thing he didn't want to do was pay taxes, which, it, again, I get. I mean, people in that line of work, that they don't want to do that. I but don't you see the big picture. Sure. I don't think you see the big picture of the money that you put in. Here. And do you um, think it also? Do you think it also was kind of his dominant personality that he wanted to hold over someone the fact that he could beat them up, he could take something from them, and that was him you know, doing it? I don't. I don't. I don't believe it was that. I believe okay. he he liked to make money. He was smart in a lot of ways, but sometimes he'd get too greedy. You know, he he yeah. convince you why you should buy it above retail. You know, also convince you why. He should buy it for low wholesale. So he was he was a master manipulator. That's one of the things we learn in this is to manipulate through perception and deception. So I want you to like me. I want you to think I'm a nice guy. Jeff, I want to find out what you got. I might take you to nice restaurants, introduce you to some celebrities. Um, and once I find that out, these big bad guys are going to come and threaten me. What are you going to do? You're going to run to your friend Frank, right? He's going to help me. He's around these guys. Really, I'm behind the whole thing, but you're, you're to never find that out. And you think I'm doing you a favor because I'm getting, I've got you, I got it knocked down. Say these guys asked you for 300000 I got it to a hundred. These guys work for us. So it's, it's about that perception and deception.
Yeah, one thing I've learned doing this is uh, I've spoken to a lot of people. Sam Gravano, I've spoken to people in prison. Uh, one thing I've noticed, they're all very good manipulators. Uh, yeah. they're, they're very smart with getting you to like them. They want you to like them. They want you to, to, to feel comfortable around them. And then very slowly, I'm not saying these individuals do that today, but I can understand how they became what they became because, you know, as you said, yeah, nice dinner. Hey, I know this celebrity. Hey, you want to meet Frank Sinatra? What about, you know, so-and-so? You, want, you feel comfortable, and then as soon as you feel comfortable, little you know they're stealing from you, and then they're going to hit you in the back of the head, and that's that. So, yeah, and, and we all have multiple personalities, multiple yeah. people too. You need a street personality because if you're sitting being nice like we're talking right now on the street, there's people that are going to take advantage of that, and they're going to take your kindness for weakness. So there's, you know, there's – there's a line and a lot of people never seen that other side of the guys because they didn't do business or they didn't have a problem with them. But when you see these guys change now, Sammy, the bull, Sammy has a um, studio out here in, in, in the Valley and I've sat with Sammy and, and we talked and uh, he's a very interesting man. And, you know, in this life, there's some guys that make money. There's some guys that do what we call heavy work. OK, violence, murder. Um, and Sammy was one of those guys that knew how to do both and was good at both. That's Frank, what my dad was. That's what I related to. Listen, Frank, let me make this clear to any listener. I, we have not spoke before this. First time I'm speaking to Frank. Frank, that is something, that's one of the reasons I started this show. Okay. I was fascinated by, and that's what we talk about on this show. We talk about the people that can do it both, right? The yeah. ones that can earn, they can hurt as well. And those are the ones that truly become transcendent members of the history of the mafia. When you look back at, Tony Accardo or Carlos Marcello or Joe Messina or whoever, they all had that common theme. You know, you hear some guys like a Roy DeMeo, he, a good earner, but he was known for killing people. You hear about another guy, he was a good earner, but he didn't really have that backbone to hurt somebody. Frank, your father seemed to have both. He could make money and he had no problem hurting people. But I want to talk about your uncle, your uncle Nick, who uh, we'll talk a little bit about here you know, and interestingly enough, I think when, when I find out about what your, who your uncle was, he kind of reminded me, in a way, a bit of you, interestingly enough. He went to the military, right? I think he was younger than your father. Um, and he comes home and he kind of just follows your your brother into what he did, or, or your, your father into what he did. But maybe he didn't have that cold, calculated, depraved kind of being. Like he couldn't actually or didn't want to actually do that. But you start kind of getting into the world, you learn the streets, and you start accompanying him collecting, right? That's how you kind of got started in, in the underworld. Yeah. Um, so my Uncle Nick was more of a soldier. When he came back from the Army, he had a couple jobs. He worked at Wrigley Field um, where the Cubs play on the grounds crew for a while. Oh, yeah. He was working on the Hancock building when they were building it as a uh, iron worker. And he was around my dad. He idolized my dad. And he seen part of what my dad was doing. And I believe it was in 1970 at a place in Marlowe's Park called Slipper Sands, where a lot of guys hung out. That's where my uncle told my dad he wanted to come in this with him. Um, my uncle didn't have that paranoia and um, that craziness where he's going to kill you because you looked at him wrong. He's going to kill you. He was a soldier. He wasn't about violence with him. He was actually very nice to a lot of guys on the street. Sometimes they took that kindness for weakness. But he had huge balls. If you told him to go across the street and shoot those three guys in the head and then cut their throats, he would. Now, my a big thing about my uncle was we bought in to my dad. We didn't buy into the mob. We bought into my dad. We bought into family. Him first. When he was brought in in 70, he was only with my dad for a few months. They're always testing you. He went one night because my dad says, we're going to kill somebody. He thought they were testing him. He was in the back seat. The guy was in the front seat. He thought the guy was in, in on this test, but it wasn't. Turned out to be his first murder, a guy named Bill Alberto that was buried by South Park. My uncle actually soiled his pants that night because he knew he was in. He started watching this life change. It was good back in the 70s. It started changing. Guys were changing. The government was getting stronger. A lot of things we did for money was changing. And once you're in, you're in. I started doing stuff with my dad in high school, 15, 14, 15 years old. Before I was ready to cross that line of killing somebody in, 
I got to see for almost 10 years, because that was in 85, I got to see how this was changing and how my dad was changing. My uncle was the one, because when I was supposed to commit my first murder, my uncle was the one that stepped in for me and said, no, I'll do this. And I was actually mad at him for a long time because I didn't understand why he was doing it, that he didn't want me to cross this line. He says, it's changing. Your dad's changing. This is no life anymore. Don't cross this line. Did you, when you committed, you know, you're doing pickups and, and going to peep shows and, and, and kind of just collecting envelopes, stuff like that. That's pretty, I mean, you know, you're just doing what's, it's business. That's that's what you're told, right? When you're approached about murder, right? First of all, did you know your father was killing people back then? And B, how does that happen, right? Because I, from what I understand, you were involved with, you were in the car with the Fekarada hit, correct? No, I was not in the car. No. I was supposed to be in the car. That was supposed to be my first tip. So your uncle told told you, you're not in on this. Stay my, away. Your dad, my uncle told my dad when we were practicing that, no, I can do this alone. I'll put Frankie's gun on me as a backup. And so we, from that point on, it was going to be my uncle alone. I was outside the area. I had a pager. If there anything that happened that was out of the ordinary, I would get paged. And we, I knew what I had to do. I knew my orders. Um, prior to that, I accompanied my uncle um, when we had to go give somebody a beating, um, burning cars, burning garages, uh, muscle. I went with my dad a few times. Um, in 1979, 1980, I wanted to go with gloves as a heavyweight. So I was good with my hands, but I don't like violence. You know, I was the guy that if I got in a fight, I would be upset and actually have tears sometimes when I was younger because I wanted to be friends with everybody. And I looked like Opie Taylor, Ron Howard, when I was growing up. So it was right pickings for somebody to hurt, you know, try but to your dad just Your dad just assumed, like, he's my blood, so he's probably the same as me, so I'll just throw him out he's there. He'll be fine. He's, he's seen it. Yeah. He had, he had a, a situation with a guy, and I think it's in the book, you know, where this guy was way bigger than him. And I ran in the garage and got a baseball bat. I was only in eighth grade. You know, this guy was like 6'4". Okay. And, you know, I was that skinny kid that you've seen in that picture. You know, all of a sudden, my, my I don't know that my dad's got a gun. I don't know what my dad's capable of. And he's nose to nose with this guy. So I'm coming up the side. I'm going to hit him in the head with the baseball bat. He seen this. My dad seen this. It didn't get to that point because the guy backed down from my dad. And he had this smile on his face. Like, you know, there were other times where he seen me handle myself in one or a situation. And he used to say, you can handle yourself. He said, but you got to quit being so nice. I said, I like to be nice. Mm -hmm. But people are going to take advantage of you. Well, then I, that's their problem because they burnt that bridge. I said, when there's a time not to be nice, I can not be nice. My thing I didn't like that I go with them is I don't like the fact that somebody gives an order to go kill somebody and, and we don't even know what it's about. You know, if it's something that's harming our family, then we do what we got to do. And I understand that. That's why that hit with my uncle that I was supposed to do. This guy did stuff to our family. Right. And when my dad went to the bosses to get the okay, he had done stuff to them too. He was a good guy at one time and he changed. You know, so I'm like, hey, this is about family. This is about mom and stuff. So that's when I stepped up. Dad, let me do this. Let, me, let this guy think that you want him to be my mentor. Because this guy was good. This guy was street smart. He always carried a gun. My dad was concerned how rough this was going to be. And he knew I was ready. We talked. We practiced. So you and your uncle were quite subservient to your dad. You kind of just did what you were told. And, you know, maybe on the surface, he was proud of you because he thought maybe you were like him. But in really deep down, you you didn't want to do that. That wasn't what you wanted to do. You were just trying to appease him, right? And I, you know, I always relate this because I do think your story is somewhat similar in a way to John Jr., Gotti. I mean, he had mentioned, and and I, I think, I, I want to say, the only other interview I've seen you do was with Lavecchia, Tom, and he mentioned this, kind of you, if your dad was in another line of work, you probably would have went into that line of work, right? Just like Junior. You wanted to kind of be around him and be subservient to him. But deep down, you you just didn't – the blood didn't flow the same for you as it did for him in a way, right? That's yes. kind of – you were just being a good son, a loyal son. Well, I, I idolized him. Yeah. Okay. And, and you know, he told me this is great. This is life. This is – I mean, it's your dad telling me this. But then when I started to see it's not like what he said it would be and – He's changing. What do you think changed your dad? 
the street. The street changed my dad. And, you know, I also feared that man. I never feared anybody in my life besides my dad. Okay. I respect a lot of people for their cap what they're capable of to this day. And I'll show them that respect. But my dad, I feared. I feared more than anything. When I went to prison and I was locked in Terra Hut for 16 days in the penitentiary in the hole, I lost that fear for my dad. And he knew it too, because when we met up in prison, he seen that I lost that fear. I respected what he was capable of, but I didn't fear him no more. The fear dissipated over the years. Interesting. And I want I'm gonna get into that in a second. I um I want to just ask one thing about your uncle real quick. He he does this Fakarata hit, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. It it's kind of jumbled. Um, but he knows if if he doesn't kill him, there's gonna be a real problem. So he ultimately does it. Do you think that murder changed him as well? Um, I think it was before that murder that changed him. So my uncle was, um, like I said, he had big loss. But in situations sometimes, some people are better thinking in a situation than others. And my uncle was one of those persons that wasn't thinking, he couldn't think as well as my dad. And one of the things my dad seen when we were in situations without my uncle was that I can think that I can adapt and I can change during that situation. So when we were practicing with the Ficarada murder, my uncle in the Ficarada murder was in the car with John Ficarada. Now he's got two guns on him now. Okay, he had one in a bag with fake dynamite and he had a radio and, a, and, and the backup gun that at one point I was gonna use, I was gonna be in the back seat. But now I'm not in the car, my uncle's alone. He's supposed to radio to my dad when they pull in position. He's supposed to radio to my dad in one car and, and, and um, a Johnny Monteleone in the other car to let them know that everything's clear. The ruse was that John believed he was driving that we were gonna put a, a, a bomb by a Denby Dennis office that was supposed to pay us money. My uncle was supposed to call first. Then he was supposed to exit the car with the door open and shoot back in the car. Well, my uncles, and I can understand this. I mean, you know, you're one on one with the guy that's very, very good killing another monster. And he got excited. He didn't call on the radio and he reached in the bag for the gun in the car. And that's how him and John started fighting in the car. My uncle was able to push him off and threw a shot into him, but it went through his arm. John turned the gun over. The bullets fell out, got out of the car and starts running across a main road at six six, seven o'clock at night with tons of traffic. My uncle knows if he gets across the street to this bingo hall, not good. Man. we're all dead. So my uncle chased him with the backup gun and feet before it, he ran up behind him and assassinated him in the back, in the back of the head. So, and then my uncle went through some alleys and he took the gloves off to wash his wound because it was bleeding. Yeah. And then he went to stick the gloves in his pocket and they oh, fell out. Well, gosh. he never said anything. And then he stuck the gun in a, uh, a sewer, but the sewer was a catch basin that was only this deep. Mm. So he told me about it. So I had to go get it later on and get it out and get it to him so we can get rid of it properly. So under pressure sometimes when he when he was in Vegas for the for the Spalatro murders when they were when they were surveilling him, they wound up killing a guy, Emilio Vesi. Um my uncle they changed all the plans. My uncle was in charge. When they got him in the van, they had a hole that was already dug in the desert to go bring him there. Well, my uncle, when he was killing the guy, he had a gun on him. It fell out. He actually rolled it up in the tarp and they threw him on the side of the road. So he, he got, he wasn't thinking clearly. I shouldn't right. say he got nervous, but he was, he, it's, it's, it's a gift that some people have. Mm -hmm. You know. So we would practice, practice. And that was constantly two things that my, Dad would get on my uncle about is not following through the way we wanted it done, or um, you know, being too nice to people, and so, not and everything that happened. So your most kids, uh, they go to like a baseball game with their dad, or maybe you know, go to I don't know, maybe maybe a father will take his kid to a you know, a strip club even when they're a kid. I don't know, a young kid. Your dad was teaching you how to kill people, right? You were doing these drills like you would do in, you know, middle school when there's a tornado. You do drills. This is how you do this. This is how you do that. So I mean, how to burn cars, how to burn garages, how wow. to intimidate people, how to survey. 
you know, he taught me, you know, every day I left my house, even as a teenager, you want to see if you're being followed. You know, and he taught me, don't turn your head. Don't let them know that, that you know they're following you because they'll back off and get more sophisticated. So, yeah, he taught me a lot of street smarts, they call them. In fact, sometimes when I'm talking with guys from New York, we'll talk and we talk about a lot of stuff that's so similar, you know. Uh, you know, and the one thing a lot of guys used to say was we used to always look at Chicago and say, why are we still standing on the corner? Why do we have the social club? Why are we making it easy for the Jeep? When John Gotti opened up the social club in New York, they were all like, you know, nobody wanted to go down there. They said, oh, fight to go because you know you're going to be on surveillance. <laughs> so, you know, you had to have that underground. There's guys in the Chicago mob over the years that made so much money legitimately that the government couldn't go after them financially because right. they had to be able to separate them. I want to ask you um, just kind of a question I had for you. I, d did you ever meet Tony Accardo or anyone like that? I did when he was older. Um, I met him at, at, um, at, a, at a wedding. Um, what was that like? Well, so in Chicago, you just don't go up and introduce people. And, sure. you know, it's, 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 um, um, he was old, and I just met him for a minute or two. Did you know who he was? Like, oh, yeah, I knew who he was. Everybody knew who he was. In fact, he was also, he was the one, very, very smart man, never did day in jail. They no. always thought outside the box. Right. He was the one that a lot of these rules that were changing was because of him. Him and Paul Rico, that's all people talked about was him and Paul Rico, how smart they were, how, how underground they were trying to go, how legit they were trying to go. A lot of Cardo's family, a lot of... Um, uh, 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 guys were going in the projection machine, okay, unions, any ways to make money legitimately, you know, and those projection machines, you work once every three days, and I think you were making 50 or 60 grand a year in the 70s, and you had to push a button, you know, so they were, they were constantly thinking and constantly, look, he went from the big mansions to a condo, because he knew, I can't have the big mansion no more, that's too much heat. Very smart man. Yeah, I've always said, I mean, he took the outfit from a kind of a gang to a, to a criminal organization. And, and really, yeah, he really took it to a, another level. It wasn't about your nationality and your background. After. I mean, the, the making ceremony, yes, that was something. But you can be a high-ranking member of the Chicago outfit and not be Italian. Like us, us Alex, very smart man, very well-respected, uh, very, you know. Absolutely. There was a lot of different guys like that that weren't good. Right. Ultimately, for you, you kind of decide, you know, more into the '80s that you know you're going to try to get in and make not a run for it, but you're going to get into like just legit business, right? You had like restaurants, you you had um, kind of some different things you were doing, and and your goal, I guess, is probably to not be involved with that world. You didn't want to go down that road, but your father was knee deep at that point. He wanted you to enter that world with him. Um, you ultimately would, would, would turn to narcotics, right? You became addicted to cocaine? Yeah. Um, so I, what I was trying to do was get away from my father. He was very controlling. I had a family now. He felt my wife was his competition. And I was trying to get away from my dad. Over the years, in the 80s, a lot of guys on the weekends, I mean, powder cocaine was socially accepted. Powder cocaine was, you know, was, was only habit for me. It's a... Uh, celebratory drug. So I used to buy it on the weekends like anybody else. Well, I seen a friend of mine that was selling the big news and I couldn't believe the money he was making. Knowing it was a death sentence in Chicago to dealt with drugs, I started And while I'm selling them too, I am partying. And it got to the point where it became a problem with my wife and uh, it became a problem for me. So when I was going to jail, I knew that, you know, um, I, need to, I need to straighten up, but this, this is not me. It wasn't me. Uh, through counseling, through um, family members, to FBI, I learned, and it's not making no excuses, I'm totally accountable for anything I've done, and I've never been a victim in the media, so now I tell you that I'm not a victim. Okay, this is my life. Uh, uh, that, that was my escape from my dad and my dad. That I would go off and party, and um, I was more of a uh, not a go and party for two day kind of people. You know, going to was more of like to get a little bit every day. And um, and the day I stepped in prison, I knew I was never going to do it again. So I've been clean all these years. No, 
I got guys saying, oh, his eyes, he's a hero in life. I've never did any of that. I, I, the only thing I did was powder cocaine. And that was it. And you know what? I, I'm not a preacher to other people that know what it can do to you, but I can just tell you that is that. I watch all this stuff out there. I try to help anytime I can if somebody does come to me. But it was part of my life. I have to accept it. It's very embarrassing. Um, I, nowadays, I eat healthy. I don't drink. I, you know, it, 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 it's it's all about doing the right thing because I got a second chance. But yeah, I got you it. absolutely did. Sure. Um, but I want to ask you about. So you you you're you're, you're doing drugs. You party level uh, a lot of the time. You're not like a like you said. You're not on the corner shooting heroin or anything. Right. But um. You know, that was important. That was big in the 80s, cocaine. We all know that. But you're, you're starting to do your own businesses. And, and you know, your dad probably finds out. He's not very happy with it. But you ultimately would. And by this point, he's making millions of dollars. And you, you've you talked about he would have money all over the city. And you knew where they were. You know where that money was. You ultimately would steal, what, $800,000 from your father. Okay. And did you think he wouldn't find out, Frank? Or What I did was so... um my dad owed me money from properties we rehab, stuff we did legitimate okay. illegal. See, my dad controlled our family. And, and he wasn't giving it to you. The way you control it is through money and fear. And we all feared him and controlled our money. And anytime we'd ask about our money now that we're adults, because he was holding my money, Kurt's money, my uncle's money. He'd hold money on my mom. Um, he says, it's all going to be yours one day. Don't worry. It's in a safe place. Now, when we wanted stuff, we had to go to him as an adult and get permission to get some of our money so we can get it. And he'd make the decision if he thought we needed it. So I'm trying to pull away from my dad. He's becoming more violent and he's changing. And I want to get into this legitimate stuff. So I start getting those legitimate stuff. Long story short, I, I decide that I am going to leave. I'm going to pick up my family and I'm going to go move somewhere. But you need money to start over. So you're saying you're prepared to take the money you had and essentially just go in the wind. And, and what? I'm sorry. Like go in the wind. You didn't have any, you want, you don't want any more contact with your father. Right. Exactly. And I knew he had this, this money and he owed me some money. I want to say a couple hundred thousand dollars. So I went to one of these hiding spots. And I originally was just going to take my couple hundred thousand, but I took the whole duffel bag. Wow. And I said, I am I am going to take this money. I am going to sell drugs. I got my businesses. I am going to make as much money as I can, and I'm going to put this money back. And I'm going to take off with my family. And the money start over. A year or so went by. Everything's going good for me. My father's not around. I'm partying still. And then, you know, all of a sudden, I said, you know what? He hasn't come around. He knows I got all this stuff. He's got to know about the money now. He knows he owed it to me. I earned it. So I said, I'm not putting it back. I had this attitude. Well, that was the worst thing I could have ever did. And that's how one thing led to another. Because one day when he found out, he thought my brother Kirk took it at first because Kirk had access to it. Then him and Kirk come to the house. And in front of my house, he's ready to kill me right there. I want my money. And then I says, oh, my God. Now he owns me. And he did, and he made my life miserable for a while. And he got that money back over time. He took two of my restaurants. He took property. I had an offshore boat, everything. It was constantly to him. I had to report to him three times a day. I liked so his He essentially manipulated you. Uh, yeah. Your yeah. First son. thing I ever did was take that money from him. Right. So he uh, treated you basically like you were a customer of his, where, you know, even though you were a son and it was your money that you made and he took from you and didn't properly give you it, he felt like he could put that over you. You were a slave to him and you had to do what he said. Um, fascinating. So at one point, he also stuck a gun to your head. Is that correct? Yeah. So while all this is going on, he has, I have to run the restaurants. If I, I used to do these fests, these Italian fests with five dollar mod, I'd make good money. He'd show up every night to get his money. Okay, that's how, I mean, he was just all over me. So I lied to him one time. I wasn't at the restaurant. I had my mother lie. And, um, you know, while I'm going on and I'm trying to pay him this money back, I'm always thinking one day, you know, unconditional love. My father's going to say, I know you made a mistake. You're doing a good job. You're doing the right thing now. You know, let's, I'm avoiding my dad as much as I can. And he takes that as disrespect. 
he can't control me. So one night he calls me, he said, son, you know, you're doing a good job. Why don't you meet me by the park? Let's go for coffee. I said, okay. I'm like, okay, maybe this is it. Good dad. He's going to, you know, we're going to work this out. Frank, did you not have to all think like maybe he was again trying to manipulate you? Like you just. He you... was so good that he got me. Okay. He got me. <laughs> okay. And I always was the kind of guy that said nobody could set me up. I've done it. I know how it's done. I'm too smart for it. Yeah. He set me up for climb and sinker. We get in this garage. He's got my car parked somewhere else. Everything we would have did. And I look at him when I close that door and he grabs me by the neck and puts a gun in my cheek. He says, he says, I'm tired of you disrespecting me. I'd rather have you dead than disrespect me. I thought, oh my God, he's going to kill me. He set me up. Now I'm thinking of my kids. Oh my God, he's going to kill me, bury me somewhere. Tell my kids that he don't know what happened. You know, that I must have ran away or something. I need to get out of this garage. I'm crying. I'm trying to hug him to stay close. And I'm using trigger words. Dad, dad, I'm your son. My kids, I've been doing everything. I don't understand. I don't know how I got out of that garage that night. Because my dad always says, don't ever pull a gun on somebody and not use it. And I seen it in his eyes. He was ready. And we walked out of that garage back in his truck. And as we're driving, I'm thinking, I can never trust this man again. Every once in a while, he's getting mad. I could see it out of the corner of my eye. And he would backhand me to the back, to the face with his fist. I'm, I'm sitting there and I keep my hands down, I'm taking that beating. I got tears coming down my face. I can't think of, this is what it's come to with me and my dad. I got to get away from him. I got to get away from him. Um, I can't believe that I made it. From that day on, I never trusted my dad and our relationship was different. Did you though, in the back of your head kind of though, realize Frank that, he ain't gonna kill me. If he would have killed me, he'd have killed me. He was gonna kill me. He was gonna kill me. So you believe there there wouldn't be a next time. There'd be no final, hey, you know, that time in the car, that was the last time you were gonna do or disrespect him. You knew the next time you wouldn't be so lucky. You were lucky, you felt to get out of the garage. I was something. I don't know what it was. Something what either I said or him knowing I was his son. I don't know what it was. Cause like I said, once he got back in the car, he got mad again. But he left the gun at the garage. I had access to that garage. I went back and got that gun. It was a five shot, 38 snub nose, Saturday night special. I carried it in my pocket every day. I said, if he ever tries again, I'm going to kill him with the gun. He didn't get me. And I feared my dad and I ran from him and I hid from him. And then we get indicted from an old case. 1995, right? Yes. 95, you get indicted alongside your uncle your father your brothers everyone gets indicted so and it was essentially for running a loan sharking operation and using for years before right 19 i believe 78 very, very weak case mm -hmm. very weak case me and my brother could have beat it if we went to court the problem was um that if if my dad fought he would, would have got a lot more time and so i decided to plead out guilty and when i told my dad he was mad at first but then, because guys weren't doing that, but I don't have any obligation. I am not obligated to the mob or anything like that. I'm, I can plead guilty. And I'm looking at 10 years to 12 years if I fight it. I got two, four, I got a four and five year old kid. And I'm looking at five years. If I, I plead $125,000 fine and I can get the drug program in there, which is 18 months off your sentence plus good time. So yeah, that's you six years, maybe. It was, it come down to, um, it came down to, I, I did 36 months. Oh, three years. So a lot of people think that I, that I got time off for cooperating. I was the first guy that volunteered to cooperate. It was a business decision with, with, with the G. I did not want to lose any of my good time, but I didn't want anything from them. I just wanted them to help me keep my dad locked up. I wasn't going to cooperate against anybody else. And, you know, no immunity. I just, it was a business. I didn't, I didn't know the government. I didn't know right. if I could trust them or not, you know. So um, let me let me ask you something, Frank, real quick. Um, bef and I want to get into the cooperation because I think that's obviously the, the, the very interesting part of all this. And your dad, what, got 118 months for this case, something like that? Yeah, it was over 10, a little over 10 years. Right. And, and you obviously you know, went to jail as well. I want to discuss in 1997, your father would tell the judge in the court, quote, I'm very sad that this brings my kids into something that could have never happened. He would also apologize to the court saying, quote, all the trouble I've caused, I'm sorry for. Um, it was all lies. It was all a show. 
Okay. That's what I was going to ask. It seems like, because again, down the road, I want to get into the family secrets trial because you, while you're in prison around 1998, around the end of the nineties, you had kicked, you know, your cocaine habit. You, you're kind of living your life on your own terms. Weirdly enough though, you and your father are housed at Milan, the same prison. At what yeah. point did you decide, okay, so, so the only way I have out is writing the FBI and saying, I want out. Tell me about all how well, that. Yeah, so it, it was more than that. So in that courtroom that you're talking about, I was already in. I had to go in because I violated for the drugs, so it's on my record. Yeah. And I'm locked up in, in NCC, maximum security, and I'm doing great. The next day I woke up, I felt like a million dollars. I'm getting this started finally. I'm going to be a new person, a second chance. The only thing I wanted was not to be in the same prison as my dad. So in that courtroom that day, I'm looking at him. I'm shackled, and he's crying to the judge. The judge told me before that. He says, do you sure you want the same lawyer firm as your dad? That takes away a lot of your rights. I said, yes, I do. I says, but, Your Honor, I says, I want to let you know. And I apologize to the court. Um, I apologize to my family. And I said everything I did. And I said, and, and, and I was wondering if I can get a recommendation to a prison with a drug program. I want to get this drug program. He recommended it. Well, my dad got up there and I'm godfather to 18 kids. I'm so sorry I did this to my kids. All that stuff. The judge wouldn't even lift his head up. When my dad stopped, he goes, are you done? Like that. He didn't buy it. He knew it. My dad said, and my brother was in the courtroom. He wasn't even talking to my dad. He waited till my dad was done to come in. And the reporters caught that because my brother was mad at my dad too. Um, so I'm in, my, I'm in um, MCC. I'm doing great time. I'm there for almost six months. I find out one day I'm going to Milan, Michigan. Oh my God, I freaked out. I freaked out. I go in my cell and I go, I can't believe it. I can't get away from this man. He's going to ruin everything. I'm working out every day. I'm doing great. I'm working in the kitchen at MCC. I got plans. Um, on the bus and plane, on the way, I wind up in Terre Haute Penitentiary and the planes break down. I'm there for 16 days. That's when I was in the hole and I dug down deep inside. What am I made of? What am I going to do with my family when I get home? How am I going to make this up? My dad. I don't fear him no more. I'm going to give him one chance, one more chance to see if he's going to be truthful, that he's going to let us go. But this time I'm going to have my guard up. I'm not going to let him manipulate me. So when I wound up in Milan, Michigan, I was with my dad for over eight months before I decided what am I going to do here. And I tested him in every way. And when he found out I was divorced because my wife divorced me when I went in, he thought that was, and he seen the good time I was doing. And he seen what I was doing in prison and how other people respected me, that he wanted me to come back in when I got out. He actually wanted me to come back in. And he said, you're going to take over the crew with Ronnie on the street till I get home, but you're going to earn it. And he gives me the name of the first guy he wants me to kill. So he believed by you, you know, trying to get out and move on from your wife. He believed you were dedicating yourself to that world. Yeah, because I you made, manipulated him, Frank. I manipulated him by everything right. he taught me. And and people say, well, he was doing bad time. No, if I was doing bad time, my dad would, would have known right away. My dad was grooming me to come back in because I hadn't been in for a while. He wants me to take over the crew with him. Me and him are like this in prison. But I gave him every chance. And I said, what am I going to do here? He wants me. He, he's got no plans. Uh, wait till we get out on the street and straighten this out. Well, he's good at killing. I'll probably wind up dead. Or number two, I came up with cooperating with the government. But I don't want to be obligated to them. That's why I wrote this letter and sent it to him. Actually typed the letter. No fingerprints because I wore gloves. Typed it. Nothing personal there. And I sent it. And it was a business. It was a business offer. I will help you. Keep my dad locked up forever. He's a sick man. I'll do all my time, pay all my fines, no immunity. But I'm not helping against the mob. I'm just against my dad. But I don't want to lose no time. Meaning, if you move me around or anything like that, and I'm in this drug program, you got to make sure I get credit for that time off that I'm going to get through the program. Do you and think... I um, got their word on everything. Before we get into the actual trial, I want to ask... Um, there's, a, I believe, 120 or so federal prisons in America, you know, from high level to low, whatever. 
Do you think it's uh, by chance they put you into the same prison as your father? That seems pretty. It seems pretty uh, incredible uh, to be honest. So when this, when I first started talking to the government, that's the first thing I asked, and they actually started laughing. Well, actually, the prosecutor Mitch Myers came out. And he was the one I asked, and Mitch Myers came out because the first time they came to see me, they wanted to throw me in front of a grand jury right away, so I couldn't change my mind. Right. Mitch Myers came out and sat down with me for 10 minutes. I found this out years later from him. And he went back in the room and said, don't ever put that kid in front of a grand jury. He's doing great time. He's mind, his mindset is perfect. He just finally had enough of his dad. He's tired of his dad manipulating him. And I never went in front of a grand jury. And I asked him, I said, did you guys put me here because of this? They said, no, Frank. Remember in the courtroom when you when it was the reporter seeing that your dad and your brother current weren't talking? I go, yeah, because that's what we thought. We thought you two were close. We thought maybe so. We didn't have anything to do with that. Gotcha. And do you the think this puts a lot of family members together so right. it's easier for visiting? I understand. Okay, so you you kind of write them and say, listen, I don't want to cooperate against anyone but my father who's sick, and I don't want to be around him, and I have the ability to put him away forever, and I'm going to help you. I'm going to do what I have to do. I'm going to do my time, and I'm going to go home, and I'm going to move on with my life. Now, ultimately, people will say, well, what actually happened and why did you do this, do that? Your uncle, uh, I guess, sees this. He finds this out, decides that, like you, he wants out of that world as well. He, you There's know, more to it than that. Okay, tell me. So when I was manipulating my dad, I used what he taught me, okay? Anger and liquor get people to talk. We're not drinking. We're in prison, but my dad has a problem with his temper and pit somebody against another. My uncle and my dad were fighting like this. He actually tried to set my uncle up on the street to have him killed because he knew my uncle wanted out. He wanted me to get my uncle somewhere. I went and told my uncle, my dad and Ronnie are down the street. They want to meet you. They're sending me in there to bring you down there. Uncle, I wouldn't go if I was you. I says, and if you repeat this to anybody, I'm gonna say I denied it. My uncle didn't go. So now my dad was mad because my uncle was bad mouthing my dad on the street because he was supposed to give money to crew members. He wasn't doing it, but he was telling people. And my uncle was trying to stick up for me and Kurt because my dad basically threatened my brother, Kurt, if you don't plead guilty, I'm not going to get my deal. Well, my brother shouldn't have ever, you're just going to get a camp or six month uh, workout. Um, so I made my dad believe that my uncle told me all this stuff about him that was bad. My dad got so mad at my uncle that, and this is all on tape, that he put out a hit on my uncle in another prison, basically saying to the guys that were there through messages that I don't think my brother's gonna stand up. You just told a bunch of guys that my uncle's killed people with that you don't think he's gonna stand up. So they actually started a plan to try to kill him and the plan got watched. And then they locked everybody down and, and they shipped my uncle to another prison. And then he started cooperating at that point. So, and he knew the writing was on the wall for him as well. So both of you knew kind of the writing on the wall. You write the FBI, they contact you, you kind of let them know, but then they contact him. Ultimately for your father and for people like Paul Shiro, Jimmy Marcello, Joey the Clown, all these guys, all these high ranking people, um, they are indicted in 2005, big case. This would what we would be called the operation, you know, family yeah. secret, right? They get murder, racketeering, extortion, all life sentence cases, right? I mean, the government's going to throw the murders, close to 40 murders were right. solved that they didn't make public on that, going yeah. all the way back. And some of the murders would 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 be obviously the John Fecarata hit, Tony and Michael Spilatro. And this is where the yeah. government would unearth what happened to those guys. Yeah. Uh, Richard Kane. I mean, a lot of them, the government closed books on them and solved those cases. So my cooperating against my dad just opened the doors. When my uncle, when there was an attempt on my uncle's life and he started cooperating, it was, he decimated them. Let me just tell you, give you an idea. Going all the way back to the early 1900s in Chicago, there was like uh, close to 1,200 documented gangland slayings with like 14 or 12 convictions all those years up to this case. This case alone was 18 convictions and um, and almost 40 murders solved by the government where they closed the books. My uncle was the first 
made member high ranking like that to cooperate and he decimated him. He decimated him. You know, I just did a show of uh, Frank uh, recently on who is the de most destructive member of the mob to cooperate, who did the most damage. Right. And a lot of it was New York talk. But I think when we look at the mob landscape, I think we can look at your uncle and say he might be the most destructive individual to one family ever in the mob. I mean, what you just outlined, how well, many murders? Because it was unheard of. I mean, in New York, I mean, there's five families. There's a lot more soldiers. There's a lot more people. Yeah. These cases, they 200 people go away. So it's a whole different level. It's a whole different setting. And, you know, before my uncle, this was big because in New York, there were a lot of guys that were cooperating. You know, we're in Chicago. There was it. Now, ultimately, for your dad, he would um, be be convicted, and he would allegedly be uh, discussed. That he took part in up, you know, double digit murders. How many people do you think your father killed in his lifetime? Do you have an idea? Well, he was he was convicted. I think I'm 13. Yeah. Um, I would say probably about 20, 25 people that I would know of. Very, very he, destructive man. He, this is how bad my dad changed. My mother divorced my dad in the in the late eighties. My dad actually manipulated my mother so he could marry his gumad, his girlfriend. His gumad's father was the police chief of Melrose Park for years. Okay, another Italian community, Joe Joey Ayupa's home ground. Right. Um, my dad didn't like his father-in-law for a while because he felt that his father-in-law controlled his wife too much. That's his daughter. So one day. I was living in an apartment that the father-in-law owned, me and, me and my wife, when we just got married. And he calls me over, to the, two doors over to the father-in-law's house. They're all there visiting. And we go out in the garage in the back. We walk in the garage, and he's looking around. And, you know, me and my father are on rough grounds here right now. I'm trying to slowly break away without him realizing that I am. And he, he looks around. He says, okay, this looks perfect. I go, for what? Because I'm going to have to get rid of my father-in-law. Me and you are going to get rid of him. I go, whoa, Dad, why? He goes, he goes, he's just got he's got too much control over my wife and I had enough of it. I go, Dad, that's his daughter. I says, I don't think it's a comp I'm trying to talk my dad out of it, but I gotta be careful because there's no line in the sand anymore. If I try too much, he might kill me. Right. And then I'm thinking, is he going to kill him and make it look like I did it? So he could say it was my son. Right. That's the problem with him. It never happened. But here's my dad planning to kill family members now. And this, is just, the this is not the man I knew. He's not acting rational at whatsoever. No. He's uh, killing or trying to kill people that aren't even connected to that world. He's paranoid. He's out of control, quite frankly. And that's, that's a story I've never heard. That's pretty incredible. Um, ultimately, in 2009, your father would be you know convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment. Now, I want to ask you quickly. There's a story that at one point in the trial – uh, your father would mouth uh, the words, quote, you're a fucking dead man to a prosecutor. Is that true? I, I don't I can't say it is or it isn't because I wasn't present. OK, but they, my dad was getting mad. So one of the prosecutors had asked me, you know, your dad well, and you know how to get him out of character, how to get him mad. And we all know when you get somebody mad, sometimes they don't think. They do that sometimes. So I told my dad, I told the prosecutor what to do. The young one, I said, he ain't going to like you. He respects the other two guys. You know, get in his face, raise your voice, and call him names oh, you know, within reason, and you'll get him mad. And they did. And, um, you know, and it was said, they, they said that, that that he did mouth it. Um, so this yeah. was like a young hotshot prosecutor, and he was yes. really laying into your dad. Right. That would have been fascinating to see. So because of that and because of the fact that my uncle, I mean, my dad put a hit out when he found out that we were we were cooperating. I mean, my uncle, $75,000 hit, $150,000 total. Um, the government had to let us know by law that this is credible, that your dad put it out. So when they were all convicted um, and my dad got life plus in 20 years or something, which doesn't matter because in the federal system, life is life. Um, he went into the special lockdown when he went back from NCC after the trial. It's called, um, it's a, uh, uh, oh gosh, it's S, S, you know, I just got brain freeze on it. But it's, it's all terrorists in there and yeah. lockdown 24 hours a day, no interaction with any other inmates. And um, 
your visits, go over a monitor, and one phone call a week from a media uh, family member. So he was with the worst, the worst. There was one other guy that was in that, Danny Gorgeous from New York, because yeah. he had a hit list, allegedly, of all prosecutors and judges. It's essentially like a mini version of like ADX. Yes, yes. And it's for people that are hitting, putting hits out on prison. They want to kill prosecutors, people that cannot be housed anywhere else. Well, my dad was a master manipulator. I think yeah, for sure. in prison, he realized that he would get close with the priests, talk a lot of religion, which he had all mixed <laughs> up. And he would use their phone because it's not recorded to pass messages out. So my dad was smart. My dad yeah. was really smart. Sounds like that. Your dad um, would pass away on Christmas 2012, I believe. Yeah. Um, I, I have two questions for you post all of this. Um, one of which uh, is about your dad. Um, how did that work out? Did you, were you sad at all? Did you ever think back to the days of your youth when he was a different individual, when he was a good dad? I mean, he treated you pretty well when you were a kid. He he probably taught you a lot of things that you you learn and take to this point of where you are in your life. So what was that day like for you? When you heard about that, though, what did, what did you – did you cry or were you sad at all? So, you know, when people tell me I did the right thing, right thing, this was my dad, okay? Yeah. But I had to do something. You know, sometimes so many people get paralyzed. You don't do nothing. It's worse than doing something. I gave my dad every chance. We got in prison together. We had a chance to change. Me and my brother were in legitimate stuff. My dad had more money. What did he go back for? Why did he go back? Okay, he was sick for a while. I told him, don't go back. You let him think you're sick. You could step back and retire in this business. You know, when this was all done and over, I before I wrote that letter, can I live with this the rest of my life? Am I missing something? It wasn't something that was done overnight. And I learned that from him. Make sure I gave him every chance to work it out. And he wouldn't. He wanted to go right back to what he was doing. And I knew at some point he's going to kill me. The first time I don't want to do some or disagree, I'm going to be dead. And if he don't kill me, everybody on the street knows that him and my uncle are fighting. They're going to kill us when we all get out anyways. Because, you know, you, you just don't, you don't, they, they don't want to take any chances like, like what happened. Um, so when my dad got down in that lockdown, it bothers me. It still bothers me to this day, you know, of, you know, what he went through. But there's times that I remember everything he did to his family. I don't understand why, but um, I felt like, you know, I, I did what I had to do. Um, the day I heard, I always thought, well, when he dies, he's going to hell. And he's going to haunt me every day. And I got to make sure I don't do nothing wrong because I don't want to wind up in hell with him. But I honestly believed in the end because Christmas Day was his favorite day. I believe that he finally got it. He finally realized what he did to the people that loved him. And then he's up above watching down saying, I know you better than anybody, Frankie. You're just like me. You better do the right thing. So I used that. You know, the day I left my kids to go to prison, I'm walking down the stairs, and those are my two little kids at the bottom of the stairs. Daddy, we love you. Don't forget, tonight we're going to watch a Little Mermaid and eat popcorn. I walked out that door. I lost it. I use that every day. You know who I answer to? My kids. Right. Okay? And yeah. is that how you – that's kind of one on one other question. Is that how you, is that what you would say to the people that say, well, Frank, I mean, this is your dad. You're the only person that I know of in the history of the mafia outside of really one other one uh, that uh, essentially cooperated against his own father, yeah. not, not his uncle or his cousin or some associate. This is your dad. This was the guy that brought you into the world. Is that what you would say to those people? You say, listen, I didn't want this for my life. I was essentially forced to do it and i live my life for my kids and my wife and for my my family not for him who was a depraved lunatic he wrecked a lot of people's lives around him okay i can go different family members i don't want to say but he wrecked a lot of people's lives and i wish there was another way i wish we could have worked it out we want and look i wasn't forced to do what i did when i followed my dad and my uncles i'm not a victim in this i I can't say because of fear, okay? I just know when I didn't fear him anymore, my head was clear. I knew I had choices, and sometimes your choices all suck, but you gotta you gotta pick one. Right. And the only thing I can think of is keeping him locked up forever because he needed it. It wasn't the dad that we knew many years ago. Right. He was a different person. He got he got so bad with his new wife and kids that. While he was locked up, she finally told him one day, 
don't call here no more. I'm blocking you. I had enough video. Okay. Um, it was getting worse and worse and worse. Frank, let me ask you something. Um, I think one of the everarching reasons I started this show two years ago, it'll be almost, I watched the film The Irishman at the end. I think it's very, the first 30 minutes I think are really good because they really show the viewer what that life is. And, and Frank Sheeran in the film, he's essentially ostracized, right? He is dying alone in a nursing home. No one knows who he is. And I remember the scene where the, the nurse, she has no idea who Jimmy Hoffa was. And he thinks in his head, I did all this. I ostracized my family. I, I'm on an island with nothing, with no one, just like your father was in Christmas of 2012. Do you ever think to yourself, why did he do this? Why did he, why did he ruin his relationship with his first wife, his second wife? Everyone around him hated him to the point where they would betray him. Why do you think he did all this? Do you think that the power of the why, world, the mafia, was that important? Why do you think he did it all? I, I think it changed him. I, I don't, I, I mean, I can't answer for him, but you're right. In The Irishman, one of the most powerful scenes for me was when he was sitting in that room in that wheelchair all alone. And you it know, just fades, felt, the doors open, right? I never suffered a day in jail. You know who suffers? Your loved ones on the outside. Absolutely. I right. knew when I went, I needed prison. It changed me. Okay, I didn't, I mean, everybody finds different reasons to change. I'm not saying that anything, anybody's right or anybody's wrong. But God, when I got with my dad, I thought this was a sign for me and him to really understand each other. My, my, my wife divorced me, I have nothing, and me and him are in prison. It don't get much lower than that. Mm -hmm. I've cleaned up now from, from, from the cocaine. My head's clear, we're gonna have some good time together for eight months. I utilized every second of that time to try to do the right thing. And when it came to the point, it was very hard for me. I used to go in my cell and there would be tears in me. Okay, tears in night. I would rather fight eight guys in an alley than do what I had to do to my dad. But I had to do something. And that's what I did. You couldn't get through to him. And, and people, look, I respect some people say it's right. Some people say it's wrong. My dad abused a lot of people. A lot of people in his family, he used and abused them. Now, when people, when family members abuse other family members, he was violent with them. Other family members have problems to this day because of it. Everybody rallies behind the family members. But when you add organized crime in it, well, that's different. You got to be loyal. You got to be loyal. You got to be loyal to your father no matter what he does to you because he's your father. Oh, really? He tries to kill you. He does all this stuff. And, and you I had to stand up to him. You also weren't even a member either. So you really had no, you didn't have to answer to anybody, really. I, didn't, I cared about when I bought into this, I didn't buy into the mob. I bought, bought into your dad. I bought into my uncle and I bought into family. Right, right. And I loved to work hard and, and I wanted to, to get ahead and I, I idolized my dad. And I figured anything that comes out of his mouth is golden. Yeah. Before we wrap this up, I have one other quick question. Um, your uncle is still alive. Uh, he's uh, 80 years old, I believe. Do you speak to him? I, I spoke to him one time. Um, uh, uh, we have some differences that, you know, I'd love to work out. Uh, uh, we see a few things different. Um, but, you know, I leave that up to him more so. Uh, uh, my uncle's going through a lot. Uh, my brother is going through a lot. My brother, Kurt. And, you know, sometimes they turn and blame me for everything. You know, and, and if it, and that's fine. If they want to blame me for everything, if they get to that better place, that's great. If they want to talk one month or year, I'm talking to my brother one month. He doesn't want to talk to me. And that's his choice. I love my family. Um, and um, I, I wish them the best. And I know everybody's going through a lot. Final question, I promise. Um, we can we can sugarcoat. You know what you did. Your uncle knows what he did. Um, it's not like you were cooperating against a bunch of small guys. I mean, this is one of the biggest trials in the history of the American mafia. Do you ever, in 2023, you know, you, you go to Chicago, okay, you're around, you're not in the witness protection program, as far as I know. Do you ever worry for your life at all? I know there's always a chance that somebody can do that something to me. I didn't go in witness protection at the beginning because I always wanted to give my dad that opportunity and not take it out on somebody else close to me to be there. I, I am one of these guys. I think like these guys. Everything I talk about, I'm not on here implicating anybody. I'm mm -hmm. telling my story. Um, uh, you know, if they want to get me, they can. 
but a lot of guys have moved on to legitimate business. Sure. A lot of their sons, which they didn't bring into life, are grown now. My yeah. They're doing very well. They're do you communicate with anyone from that world? I do. I do. I don't I won't say no names no. though. And I don't want to know their business. I, you know, I'm very respectful. You know, a lot of guys run their mouth, you should be dead. Well, then do something about it. Because right. guys run their mouths, I don't care about. I know the guys that don't run their mouths. I know what those guys are capable of. I respect what they're capable of. I'm not going to step on their toes. I'm not going to implicate them in anything. I'm not going to do anything like that. I'm telling my story. I stay out of the way. I don't go in certain neighborhoods. I don't want anybody to think I'm challenging. Yeah. And and, and, and that's the way it is. I'm not going to be stupid. I'm not trying to challenge anybody. There's some badass motherfuckers out there. I don't know if we can swear or not, but absolutely yeah. God. But I've been doing my thing, and but I'm not I'm not one to run and hide, you know. And I do have to accept the title of rat, uh, uh, snitch, whatever you want to call it, for whatever reason. I'm not trying to justify what I did. I'm just telling you what I did. You don't why. seem to have many regrets. I, I I know I I do have some regrets. I regret what I've done to anybody that didn't deserve it. Okay, um, I do have some regrets, but I I have a second chance to live my life every day and practice what I was preaching. So if I went back and did, I had an opportunity to do something that was in the gray area where I could have made a lot of money and I passed on it because I felt it was too close to what I used to do. And I can't do what my dad did because then I'm worse than my dad. I remember Frank uh, very recently, and I, I've, I've, I've talked to people about this that have a problem with what I say. I used to be, oh, I don't like rats. I don't like this. I don't like that. But then I started to realize that people like you are, are humans in the end, and you have a decision to make. I'm sure there are nights where you think about your father and the good times that you had or the good times you had in the street, and you regret what you did, and you have to face the decision on your own. And who am I who was never involved in the streets? Who am I to say what you did was a rat move or not? That's your life and your business. And I think I've really grown in the thought of, what you did and what that world is. And I think there are still a lot of people that have that stupid way of thinking. But again, it was your decision that you made for your life and for your kids. And who are we or who am I to say anything about it? But, so, it, but it comes with the territory, Jeff. Yeah, okay? it does. And it, you know, all, the only thing I've ever said was, you know, people will say that, but they'll make a comment, well, he couldn't do his time. I laugh at that. I don't get mad because, look, the rat part, that's fine. But I couldn't do my time. You don't know my story. At least do your research first to see. You can disagree with what I did and say I'll never do that. Me, me, I don't say what I would do if I wasn't in that person's shoes. Okay. I sit and talk to Sammy Gravano. A lot of people snitch. A lot of people snitch for different reasons. Yeah. And, um, you know, everybody has their reason. Which one's right? Which one's wrong? You know. It's not really our job to judge, though. I mean, how many people said Sammy snitched because he couldn't do his time? And then he went in another case. Pled guilty allegedly for his kids, so they wouldn't get time. And did what? Close to twenty years. So everybody said he snitched because he couldn't get time. You look like a fool. Now. Yeah, everyone has different reasons. And everybody we, has yeah. different reasons, but you still got to own the title because it still goes. Sure, absolutely. You know, whatever your reason was right or wrong, it it, it comes with it. Mm -hmm. And you, it. you seem to be pretty forthright about that, Frank. A Calabri Jr. A pretty incredible story, really. I, I've been wanting to speak to you for a while. I want to talk um, and tell people in the description of the video, go grab the book. I, I think this is a really terrific uh, book. Obviously, it's been uh, kind of um, authenticated, if you will, which I think is important. Um, and it tells your story, a family secret, really, a family story. It's not just about you know the, the mob. It's about your wrestling with trying to get away from the world your father was so inundated in and wanted you to be in and, and and you tell that story. You're also doing, Frank, um, at FamilySecretsTour.com, pretty interesting. I was actually asked about this when I was in Chicago. That Someone asked me about this tour, and I said, well, I'm about to speak to him. You do a tour. Um, you, I, I guess, you you have a bus, and you you take people around, and, and and you teach them about what kind of things do you learn on this trip? So it's, it's, it's totally private tour now. Your group can be anywhere from 2 to 40 people. Um, if it's 40 people, I use the bigger buses. Uh, I'm going to take you around and I'm going to tell you a lot of stories. My story, I'm going to take you through the history. 
of Chicago. I'm going to take you to locations where murders happen, where they hung out. I'm going to take you through the different Italian neighborhoods. It's not only about the mom. I'm going to take you around Chicago and show you all the different neighborhoods. And then I tell you my story. Then I take you into Chinatown and I go into my story. Um, and why we're driving around. I show you good restaurants to eat. I show you restaurants where guys used to go in the life many years. Um, the only thing I don't do is point to a building and say, hey, Tony and Joe are in there and they're booking every Tuesday. You know, because then You're not giving up uh, criminals currently. But it's, I'm doing a lot of uh, private events now. I'm doing a lot of uh, uh, motivational speaking. So the tours I'm doing less and less because I'm getting busier and busier and I really enjoy it. But I'll do anything private with anybody. If you go to familysecretstours.com and get a hold of um, us. I can set anything up, and I've been doing a lot in Vegas with the Mob Museum too. Uh, yeah, and, and I would say it's a great. I mean, Chicago, I, I think nationally gets a bad rap. I, at least that's what I thought. I went there, and I was, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a great town, and I think you know, if you're there for a couple of days, or or, or you're in Vegas, or something, you know, that would be a great thing to do. So you know. Yeah. At any rate, Frank, um, just a, a fascinating story. And maybe someday when we're in Chicago, I'll meet you. We'll, we'll have a drink or something. Uh, you're an interesting character for sure. Um, Frank Calabrese, thank you for coming on. Uh, is there anything you want to leave us with before you go? Uh, I, you know, I, uh, no, <laughs> I just, I'm enjoying every day of my life. You know, I got diagnosed with FSC 2000. I've been fighting that. And, you know, um, it, I just look at it as an obstacle. I never look at poor me. I look at how can I get around this stuff? And I am just so happy to have a second chance in life. And seems uh, like you are. My cir circle's small, and that's how I keep it. But, you know, I, I appreciate anybody that's interested in the story. And hopefully I get people once in a while, too, that are like, you know, because you were able to do the game, you gave me inspiration to do what I need to do the right thing in life. Sure. I mean, there's a lot of people out there with whatever you're doing. You know, you meant, you know, you mentioned, you know, your, your drug addiction at one point. There's a lot of people that have that problem in this country right now. Yeah. You know, there, there's different ways you can take this story. You don't have to be a, a an up and coming mobster to to understand this story. But Frank, either way, thank you for coming on. A fascinating you, story, and uh, I appreciate you coming on. Everyone, go check out the book. Go buy it. it it's worth it if if you're a mob aficionado. Thank you, Frank. Appreciate thank it. You. And thanks everybody for listening. As always. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you hit the like button. We'll see you next week here on The Sit